California. And um, these Doodleverse tools, they kind of, they, they've kind of been pulled together over the last uh, two years or so. And um, they're really kind of uh, the culmination of many years of wanting to provide software to the geoscience community for the purposes of carrying out image segmentation and to try to make it as generally useful as, as we can for a broad set of, um, of objectives. Um, so yeah, really happy to be here. Back to you, Evan. Awesome. So the outline for today is that we want to introduce the whole project, which we refer to as the Doodleverse, as well as just image segmentation in general. So to motivate why do we need these sets of tools and how can they be useful? Then we'll give an intro to the tool Doodler that we'll be talking about today. We'll give a live demo. Probably Dan will do the live demo. We'll then pass it off to everybody to sort of doodle all by yourself so you can get a feel for it. It's a tool that needs some um, practice to be able to use correctly and to understand some of the edge cases because it's a human in the loop machine learning tool. So it's a, it's a live tool. It's running live at, at the time that you're doodling. Everybody who doodles the uh, images, I Dan subsetted a bunch of images. We provided them on the Google Drive for everybody. They're all named with the last name on the Google Drive. We'd love for you to doodle those and then all collectively do a Zenodo data release of all the images and labels. So we'll talk about that. We'll live demo some of the tools that are useful after you've done doodling, which is called, which is the utils folder. And then we'll pass it off to all of you for you to use the utils so you understand how to get your, uh, a lot of information out. And then we'll wrap up, do some Q&A and plan for the next week. Uh, for next week's class, which is more of the deep learning image segmentation pipeline, which we call Jim, which we'll go over. And I just want to say that feel free to drop questions. I mean, we'll try to monitor the chat chat as much as possible. The the do while all of you are doodling, um, this is sort of a free time to just have Q and A and do some discussion. If there are any deeper questions that you have about anything that we're introducing. Um, so that's what I want to uh, say that it, that's a perfect time to ask questions and to. Uh, uh, get our opinion about what, what's going on. So the, like I said, the best way to learn about doodling is to actually doodle. So the two hours that we have here are more like a clinic than a webinar where we're going to be giving you a lecture for two hours. I mean, thank goodness, right? Two hours of us talking. Um, so most of the time is people doodling on their own machine and talking about it. And I just want to say that you know, instead of buying shoes or checking emails or doing other stuff on Zoom calls, I often find myself doodling. And so in, in, instead of passing this off to, to other people, I, I tend to do it because I find that it's a relaxing activity. So here are two things that Dan and I like to trot out whenever we talk about doodling, that it's, it, we're effectively coloring here. And it's a great relaxation practice when you're on probably more stressful Zoom calls than this one. We hope this one's not stressful. So I'll pass it off to Dan. All right, thanks, Evan. Um, so this slide really is just a transition slide, I guess. Um, we're going to be talking about Doodler for the most part today. But first, I'm just going to talk um, a little bit, next slide, about the Doodleverse, what it is, and just a real sort of brief summary about how all of the different tools kind of mesh together. Uh, the Doodleverse is named after Doodler, which was the first tool that we made um, in this series. The other two tools that, um, and so Jim is also um, basically ready. Um, and Zoo is another tool that is integral to the Doodleverse that we're still working on, um, but exists up on the Doodleverse if you go to the Doodleverse GitHub site, which is down there in the bottom right hand of the screen and also in that QR code. Um, the motivation was to provide a set of tools that work together for the purposes of a uh, image segmentation, which is pixel wise classification. Um, but more specifically, it was uh, tries to address two different things. One is um, a, a an accessible pipeline for geoscientists like us um, that has been tried and tested on imagery that we care about. Um, such as, you know, imagery from remote sense platforms like um, satellites and from aerial imagery and things like that, but also gridded data, um, uh, like sort of non-specific gridded data. That could be things like sonar data or geophysical data, or it even could be model outputs. And I know that uh, CSDMS um, 
is obviously a group of numerical modelers who are concerned with um, simulating Earth's surface processes. And so we think that even if you're not particularly engaged with images, like photographic images, we still think you might get benefit from these tools because they might um, facilitate your segmentation of your model outputs and it might kind of lead into new unexplored areas for you. So Doodler is, um, is it serves two purposes. It's for segmentation of any arbitrary image, image being that kind of uh, all encompassing term of any graded data set on a regular grid. Um, you might just have one image that you want to segment, or you might have maybe a, a couple of dozen images that you can quickly segment. Um, Doodler is designed to take a lot of the work out of that enterprise, rather, you know, rather than an alternative workflow, which might be uh, uh, digitizing polygons, for example. Uh, there's a couple of different downsides to digitizing polygons. One is that it's very time consuming. Another one is that um, it's quite difficult to get uh, the edges correct, like you have to actually line up the edges of your polygons. And another disadvantage is that often it's quite difficult to make a call about what you see at the transition between two different thematic classes that are uh, apparent in the image. So Doodler is designed um, to take a lot of that, but it's, it's designed to do heavy, heavy lifting, uh, but it's also designed um, for making a more objective call as to what uh, the pixels uh, represent at boundaries. So it's for generic image segmentation purposes. It's been tested on imagery all the way from kind of cell phone images all the way up to satellite images and beyond. Um, we've, it's purposefully designed to be uh, um, generically useful for, the, for a range of image types but it could also be repurposed and slightly modified if you wanted to for specific applications that you may have um, you know and because it's open source code you are obviously encouraged to fork it and to modify it as you see fit and if you see and like any of these tools that we're going to present um, and if you see benefit in the modifications that you've made to the general community then we encourage you to to contribute that back and we'll talk a little bit about that later on the second purpose of Doodler is to, uh, well, it's used in the same capacity, but it's uh, for the purposes of uh, training deep learning image segmentation models. So it's for generating uh, larger sets of labeled images that you can then subsequently train a machine learning algorithm. That machine learning algorithm could be from deep learning, or it could be from machine learning, or it could be from somewhere else. Um, what we have implemented in the gym software is a um, is deep learning um, the application of fully convolutional models uh, in deep learning uh, specifically units which have been proven in a number of fields both within the geosciences and outside to uh, be generally useful um, and powerful image segmentation uh, implementations so that's what gym is and gym is a, an end-to-end -end workflow that helps you uh, ingest um, images and labels that could come from Doodler or come, could come from elsewhere, and then uh, get those images and labels into a format that can then subsequently be used by um, machine learning algorithms, and specifically TensorFlow, which is you know very popular deep learning um, uh, set of software, and then provide utilities for experimentation of training those models and then application and implementation of those models so that's as evan said that's what we're going to do in the second class zoo finally we're not going to talk too much about zoo but i just wanted to kind of give it a, a brief introduction here and we will, probably won't talk about it again until next week um, but zoo is basically uh, it, it's designed to be a collaborative uh, enterprise where um, we, we evan and i and our colleagues are going to contribute models that do generic uh, things for image segmentation. We're concentrating mostly on photographic imagery, and we're concentrating mostly on uh, models that do kind of generic things like find water, um, find vegetation, find sediment, and things like that. They're things that might be generally useful for the geoscience community, but that we have a specific end goal for. It's also going to be and it has becoming a collection of 
uh, example, Jupyter Notebooks, that um, demonstrate how to take a model that has been trained using Jim and then apply it in different contexts. Once you have a model that's been trained, you, you get a, a, a sense of how accurate it is by virtue of pointing it to a validation set or a test set. But you don't uh, always know exactly what the optimal way to implement that model is. And so that takes a little bit of experimentation as well. And so, well, that's what Zoo is basically designed to do. So those three tools, they comprise the Doodleverse. And then there's a collection of um, other tools that we're building, uh, other applications that basically use these tools that we use for our own research. OK, um, next slide, please. So, Image segmentation is, um, is the classification of image pixels, the pixel-wise classification uh, using supervised machine learning. Actually, it's not just using supervised machine learning. It, it, it can be unsupervised machine learning too. Uh, supervised is just when you provide the, the, the machine examples. Unsupervised is where you allow the machine to um, discover what the classes are for itself. Supervised machine learning is very much the state of the art, especially within geosciences. You'll see many, many more applications of supervised uh, machine learning because it's generally much more powerful. And what I'm showing on the screen here is an ex a good example uh, paper that came out um, that used uh, as an algorithm that's very similar to a unit here for um, pixel-wise classification of shellfish re reefs. And it's a generally useful tool because it allows you to uh, classify at the smallest scale, i.e. one pixel. Um, if you're looking at gridded model outputs, for example, you could kind of, that would be your, you know, your, your smallest grid size. If you're looking at pixel outputs or a rectified imagery, that's kind of the, the, the smallest uh, spatial scale at which you're able to make any inference. And so therefore you can use it for, um, many different things like looking at the occurrence of a thing, how much area that thing occupies, um, what distribution of things exist and what their spatial proximities are. Um, and it's also useful as a kind of generic uh, tool for the purposes of um, data cleaning too. You can actually identify certain things and remove them from consideration in a subsequent process. Um, that could be noise or it could just be removing a specific um, feature in the image that you don't want a subsequent process uh, to, to look at or analyze. Next slide. Here's just a couple of examples I'm gonna show of, of, of image segmentation that's been used in projects that I've been involved with. You know, that there's, as I said, this has been kind of developed simultaneously across many research objectives of, of, that myself and Evan have had. Uh, these are just two examples from um, static cameras where you have um, a particular feature of interest on the left there we're interested in just finding water in flooded um, scenarios from webcams on the right it's a more specific uh, situation where we're interested in enumerating uh, the different uh, classes that you can see there for the purposes of coastal processes and, and tracking uh, landforms in the coastal zone you can imagine that this is, you know, that this could be extended to any number of classes um, that you care about, from from simple two case two case scenario like on the left to to a five case scenario and you can see on the right and and more. And here's a, an example. You can skip through the whole thing, Evan. Thanks. Um, here's an example of how we I personally use uh, image segmentation for the purposes of data pre-processing and data cleaning. Um, this is a typical um, series of images that are collected by uh, my group at the USGS, uh, the USGS plane cam. W these images are then used within a structure for motion, which is digital photogrammetry to reconstruct um, the 3D elevation that you can see on the bottom. And it's really, it's, it's a model that's used to uh, identify water and remove it from consideration because it allows uh, much, much greater computational efficiency for the um, for the subsequent process. We don't have to manually clip out the areas that we're not interested in. Um, and it also greatly reduces the amount of um, uh, com computational resources required to find the solution. And in line with all of the examples that Dan has shown, um, there's been a collective effort that Dan led called Co-Strain, which is a, a 
a billion pixel, 1.2 billion pixel data set of human labeled images that we created using Doodler. So many of the people who were involved in the labeling are on the call. Um, Dan, Sharon, Venus, and, and JC might be on, not. But here's an example. We, we labeled a bunch of imagery that comes from many different um, sensors, both aerial images and satellite images. And this just shows you an example of the range of different imagery that we use and the range of different classes that we used and that the utility of Doodler in a bunch of different scenarios. The point not only was to try Doodler in a bunch of different places and to assemble a team and to understand an iterator agreement, but it was also to create this data set that could be used to hot start a model where if you were interested in the same classes, if somebody else was interested in the same number of classes, but a different set of imagery, then these could be used as training data. So Doodler is very useful for making these sets of training data with a bunch of different sensors um, that can be reused. So this was a data, this is a data release, the preprint. It's in re revision right now, but the preprint is available in Earth Archive and the data set is live through USGS Science Base. So you can see, you know, here's Landsat and here's uh, USGS Ortho Mosaics that were created. So we've done a bunch of different, these all have several one, two, three, four, seven classes, but the data set ranges from four class images to probably 10 or 11 class images. So it's been used in a wide range of situations. So the, the examples that Dan showed earlier in the previous slides are not the only examples that we have. We've just used it in a ton of different um, uh, applications and deployments. In general, all of these pieces tend to fit together, just like Dan said, in, in what we tend to call the image segmentation design pattern. So Doodler is used for labeling the data, and then there's this piece in the middle that's Jim, and the piece that, that will take the images and process the images. And then eventually we're hoping to build out and have built, built out, but but continue to zoo. So this is mostly rehashing what Dan went over on the first slide, but just to sort of demonstrate that there are clear flows in this pipeline to get all of these tools and the data from these tools to be interoperable with each other. So it was designed and we're building it from the ground up to make sure that all of these things are interoperable and smoothly work with each other. Any data creation that any of you do in the future fortunately can be added to this in terms of this bucket on the right labeled data. Co-strain is just an example. And all of the use cases that Dan showed of labeled imagers is just an example. But all of this labeled data is useful because it can, for other people or for yourself, can be backfed into the beginning of the pipeline. So anybody could use the co-strain data or anybody could use any of the labeled data that you all create to build better models in the future and sort of um, bootstrap together uh, things that work in uh, models that work in uh, and are generalizable and work in other situations or do research on what situations it works in, like transfer learning and things like that. So this is just a demonstration of all the tools really working together. So Doodler is the focus of this class. So the instructions that uh, we provided in the email sort of lay out how to get started with Doodler. But in general, when you're thinking of mounting a campaign where you're doodling images or creating, uh, or, or if you're going to do it or going to muster a team to be able to do it, the first step is to, is to look at our GitHub repository. So the Doodleverse headquarters is really the main port of call for uh, understanding all the activities that we're doing. And all of the different projects that we've talked about live in their own separate repository in that organization. So you can see this is the Doodler one, which is Doodleverse slash dash Doodler. Um, we've enabled, we'd love it if you have issues to drop a new issue in for us and we can triage it from there. If you wanna do a show and tell or just let us know what's going on, the discussion tab is open. We'd love to be able to talk in there uh, about and see what everybody is doing so that uh, we can help to foster a community of users around that and give you support because a lot of the problems that you've run into, if you do run into them, we've run into them before, or a lot of the questions or choice points you're, you're, you make, we've had to make those before. So the project itself is, uh, the repository is quite active. Dan and I try to respond to issues as soon as they come in. So if you're going to 
start using Doodler or want to point anybody to start using Doodler, the first step is just to download the code and uh, make the Conda environment. It's been, I run it without using Conda on some machines and it works fine, but the Conda environment is the surefire way to make it work. We know we have a current M1 Mac issue that we're trying to figure out how to move forward with that. But we haven't had any issues on Linux or Windows machines or previous non Apple Silicon machines. So you you provide, you bring images that you, once you've downloaded it, you sort of select the images that you want to label. And just as Dan said, this can be generic. This is, we're using images in a generic sense here. They can be model output. They can be anything that's gridded that sort of looks like an array. You provide a class list. So you say you want to do water, sand, or people and computers or something like that in the images that you want to label. And Doodler uh, leverages your browser to operate when you run. So we're recommending right now, there's a little bit of a hiccup with using uh, some browsers. There's a little uh, thing that we can describe later, but we found that it works. The Firefox is recommended, but it works on Chrome and Edge and other Safari, I think. And you, once you start Doodler, you are interact interactively labeling images. And once you've done the images, once you've done a, a set of images, you can stop if you just have a few images to label. Or as Dan said, you can continue to label for some sort of follow-on machine learning work. And in general, the, the pathway out of Doodler is to use the, util, the scripts and the utils to prep the output for either follow-on machine learning or follow-on analysis. That gives you the masks or the labels or the overlays if you want to see the, the, the nice examples that we showed earlier. So that's sort of the seven step workflow for working with, or the stepwise workflow for, for how to technocratically use Doodler. But we'd really appreciate, just as Dan said, I just wanna say again, we'd love people to join the project and make issues and help us out uh, and be a part of the team. I promise we'll get on to the live demo in a minute, but this is um, just a video that was pre-prepared um, of Doodler in action. This is it just uh, working on a fairly simple image um, of just, you know, as you see, this is a beach and the two classes that you can see in the top right hand corner, water and land. Um, they are the classes that you write in that text file. So um, you, in your in the repository, if you if you clown, uh, clown it, if you've cloned it, you'll see that there's a little file in there called classes.txt. And those you just write in the classes that you're interested, in, and then they appear as as buttons when you launch the tool. Um, you'll see that it's running in a web browser, as as, as Evan said. It, it can it's generally designed to run on localhost, which is that is that web address that you can see on the top there. Um, it's also set up if you wish uh, to if you if you want to put in the effort, you can get it to run on a server, and and then serve that out to people. Um, Evan and I have both done that. You know, it's a little hiccupy where if you don't know what you're doing with web serving, um, but it does work. And um, we'd encourage you to do that and, and to share experiences of how you did that as well, um, as if you're interested in, in helping us do that. Um, but it's written in Python, it's native Python, but it's uh, using a tool called Plotly. Uh, it's actually dash Plotly. Um, which is kind of a port to JavaScript to allow it to be kind of this web, uh, interactive web viewer. It's got two tabs. As you can see, what, one tab is to really just try to maximize the amount of real estate that your image occupies on the screen. Um, you have a bank of controls on the side that, um, that we will go into during the demo. Um, you provide doodles of every class that is visible to you on, in the image. Um, ideally, in every part of the scene too, you'll see that in, in this example, I'm you know quickly going across the entire image um, because I want to make sure that most most of the image is covered. Um, you generally set the um, settings on the right hand side for a whole group of images. You don't necessarily have to modify those settings uh, for every individual image. And then when you're done with an image, you switch to the next tab. You select a new file and then you switch back again and off you go again. So that's basically the, the gist of it. Um, it does run in any web browser, but we strongly recommend Firefox. 
there's a paper that we provided a link to, and these are two images from that paper. If you're really interested in kind of going into the guts of what's going on here, there's two ways to do it. There's to look into the codes, but and there's also to kind of refer to those codes with respect to this paper. The paper is designed to kind of introduce the topic of the, the um, this this paradigm of, of labeling images, which is called human in the loop. There are a number of really good labeling tools out there. Um, that kind of mostly follow the line of polygons, right? There, there's 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 kind of simple polygonal workflows that exist, and then there's uh, other toolboxes that allow kind of to take a little bit of the work out of polygonal workflows. But as I said, you know the the, the advantages to this approach is that it deals with um, transitions quite nicely. You don't have to necessarily label up to the edge. And that's especially relevant for earth science imagery, I think, where you have this mixed pixels situation where you have a pixel that could be several things. You have, a, you know, gradual and abrupt transitions. And, you know, especially in areas, uh, you know, of Im Im imagery of natural environments, that's especially important. So you provide the, the human in the loop aspect of this is that you have a human that's providing the annotations to a machine learning algorithm that's running behind the scenes. As soon as you stop, as soon as you hit that compute button, the um, image, uh, there's, a, there's a bunch of features that get extracted from the image, which is really just passing uh, convolution kernels of different sizes over the image to extract certain features. Um, that then goes into a multi-layer perceptron, which is a simple neural network uh, that provides the probabilities of each class in each pixel and instead uh, so we researched two different ways to go from there we researched um, taking the maximum probability of each class in each pixel and we also researched an alternative workflow which is a little bit more sophisticated that's called the conditional random field and basically what that does it's another machine learning model but it's completely independent from the um, from the first one you provide those um, those initial probabilities, and it figure it constructs a graphical model that evaluates the likelihood of each pixel given the features that uh, it extracts from the image. So it does have the ability to undo some of the labels that were prov were provided to it from the from the NLP, the multi-layer perceptron. You'll notice though, as you gain experience with Doodler, that oftentimes those two you, those two solutions are very much the same, but in some specific situations, it actually has a little bit of more agency. And th that agency is really governed by the amount, uh, the, the value of the parameters that are going to during the demo. But you'll see, it, uh, if you have it launched already, you'll see that there's two, um, there's, there's two banks of settings in the, in the software. One's called post-processing settings, and that's really referring to the CRF, and then there's the classifier settings, and that's referring to the MLP. And then I'll, I'll talk about each one. But the uh, the two things to know is that the CRF it has this blur factor and this model independence factor. And you can actually tweak that a little bit to get you slightly different results. Another thing that I, I, I think is important to communicate at this juncture, and I want to say it before I forget it, I think, that um, Doodler is designed for relatively rapid labeling right it's its primary goal and you know it is really for generating training data sets for the subsequent process as we've said this training of deep learning models we've gone through by experience we've kind of arrived at an, a kind of a decision and an understanding that the the labels that you provide the deep learning algorithm don't necessarily have to be 100 percent perfect they can have a little bit of error in them because if you give, because deep learning algorithms are inherently probabilistic and they cut through complexity really well. And that's why they're so popular. So there's, you know, there's an understanding amongst uh, machine learning researchers that, well, there's two understandings. One is garbage in, garbage out, which is real. Like if, you, if your labels are garbage, then you will get, definitely get garbage out. However, you can, you can flex that a little bit, and there is a little bit of uh, leeway in terms of the amount of error that you might see. So Doodler will generally give you good results, but you may see that there's a few pixels that are, that are wrong. We encourage you not really to worry about that too much. It really does depend on your intended, out, uh, your intended purpose. 
and we offer two things there. One is that we've got post-processing tools that we're developing that will help you kind of refine that, uh, kind of smooth over some of that pixel level noise that you might see. And then the other thing is that if you're using this for the purposes of training these gym models, then we have kind of determined through experience and experimentation that there's a, you know, it's, if you give the models sufficient imagery, then it can generally cut through that complexity to the point that I've got models that I'm working on that are actually much better than I could do myself. You know, the outputs of those models are, 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 are generally better than I can actually label myself. So I won't say that before I moved on. Um, the next slide I'm going to talk about um, another important thing that I want to communicate, and we will get onto the demo in a minute, I promise, um, is that it's generally designed to work on a commodity laptop or a commodity desktop, right? Where, you know, we know that geoscientists don't generally tend to have, you know, really souped up uh, computers with lots and lots and lots of RAM. This will work obviously really well if uh, the more RAM you have, but um, well, general advice, if you're in a kind of a low RAM or low CPU kind of environment is to use smaller images because it's just it's going to consume much less memory and you're going to get your outputs in a much more reasonable time. Um, the other motivation for using generally smaller images is that you don't have to zoom in and out and pan around, which can actually take some time. We are developing different tools that um, actually, a person on this call, two people on this call, I want to give a plug to Sharon Fitzpatrick and Venus Ku. They are um, young computer scientists and software developers who are helping us basically turn Doodler and Jim and that we're building applications. And one of those applications is another tool that we're going to hopefully come out with next year, which is going to enable us to doodle on maps and pen around. But um, for now, Doodler is really designed for this smaller imagery. Doodler does provide uh, the tools in the tooltip in the top right hand uh, corner uh, that does allow you to zoom in and out, but it's not necessarily the most efficient workflow. Um, so if you do have large images, then we advise you to chop either chop them up or if you can, downsize them and then you can just subsequently upsize the labels. As we, this is a kind of all part of the same message, really, of, of communicating that if you're if you're using this these labels subsequently for training segmentation models, then some amount of interpolation as a result of upscaling and downscaling is actually tolerable. Um, if you if you if it's intolerable for you to actually change the this the size or the aspect ratio of your pixels, then we would um, we would advise that you chop your images up. For example, I use a lot of uh, very large satellite scenes and they're just chopped up into smaller bits that, that are much more manageable and it's much quicker to doodle them without zooming in and out. Um, next slide. Another thing that we encourage you to do, well, not necessarily encourage you to do, but something to be aware of if you're working um, on a, a larger project where you're trying to generate lots of imagery for the purposes of training these models is that it's quite useful to know how difficult your task is. We found, uh, we did a couple of different experiments with this early on, and we found that even among so-called experts um, who are well used to looking at imagery, this is uh, imagery of, of coastal environments, um, it's probably hard to tell from the graphic, but these are just aerial images of coastal environments where you have deep water and breaking waves and very shallow uh, water and then land. We found it was actually fairly hard to make that call between shallow and, and, and deep, for example. These are subjective things. Um, and so going through an exercise of, of comparing the outputs from multiple people of the same images, um, is, a, is, is very worthwhile for a couple of different reasons. One is that it allows you to uh, decide on, on a final set of classes that are doable by a group of people. And then further, it allows you to then quantify what the expected error might be in that. And that's really kind of your irreducible error. That's something that you can't do much about. Um, you can change the settings on the software and you can adopt different strategies. You can talk among yourselves about what the best strategy is for doodling in groups. And these are things that we talk about both in the Doodler paper and also the Coast Train paper that Evan referred to before. But just bear in mind that you may have some disagreement 
and that there are ways to get around that disagreement. And they're, they're talked about in the paper. These, these are figures actually from, there's a very similar figure in the Doodle paper that talks about um, how you might quantify that. Um, in addition to checking agreement, it's, it's also this question of how many classes do you use? And I just wanna tell you, we don't have a solution for this. Every time we doodle, it's an argument or a, a heated discussion to make sure that we have the number of classes that we want. And Doodler, the utilities provides ways to merge classes. So if you start with like 10 classes, but eventually you're gonna, you think you wanna make a model with just three or four, that's possible, but it's not possible to go the other direction. So that's always something to keep in mind. And there's some push pull associated with this of uh, getting better results with if you were with a smaller class list or, or hoping to make a more generalizable model. I just, we're just putting this up here to tell you that this is a persistent issue and one that uh, we can give some guidance on, but don't have an answer to 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 hold you to. So I think that this, I think we should just move on to the live demo, right? This is the yeah, yeah. So when Dan, as Dan gets it, gets this. Oh, this should have been. Uh, yeah, this is the live demo slide. So I'll stop sharing my screen. And then I just need to share the right screen here. Um, so I'm going to give a demo here. Um, I'm using a little tablet because I do a lot of I do a lot of doodling, as you probably tell. So I actually have this little tablet um, that I use. It does work fairly well for you know if, if you're using a, a mouse as well. And obviously most of you are probably using a mouse, but I prefer to use a tablet and a stylus. This thing costs three hundred dollars, um, and it works pretty well. So the first, um, I've got a couple of images here. There's, there's um, I can't remember exactly, I think there's 11 classes here, but only a few of those classes are actually ever present in the scene. This is, um, this first image I'm gonna show you is just a, a situation where you just have one class. And all you do in this situation is you just kind of give it one uh, example doodle, right? And then it will, it will complete the scene, right? So this is the, the most simple example that you can think of. This is just water. And what it's done there is it's completed the scene. And now I'm, this, I'm on the second tab. This uh, user ID up here, this is purely optional. This, um, this is just for your own accounting purposes. It will default to some string that you can ignore. Um, this is only relevant, obviously, if you need to keep track of who's doodling what. Um, and it's especially important, obviously, then if, if you're using multi multi um, doodler contexts, then you're looking at. I've just got a few images loaded here. If you had many, many, like many more images, you'll see a little scroll bar in here, and you can kind of just go through and select one. Um, what it does is, you know, you've got a folder um, of of images. Um, that you've already populated, you've put them inside your assets folder. And it's just going to step through each of those, it's going to present the images that you have left to doodle. What's going on in the background is it's just got this little timer thread that's basically checking on what images have been done and what images remain to be done. The images that get that have been done, they get copied over to your labeled folder. And then the program just really, it's just really, really cluggy, but it reads uh, the two lists of folders and then it only presents you the images that are left to, to do. So here I'm in a situation where I've got a little bit more of a complicated scene. So I'm just going to go ahead and doodle it and I'll try to talk as much as I can as I do it. Um, I tend to get the easy stuff done first so I can readily identify water. You'll see that I'm kind of, you know, I'm that water here is distinguished from white water because I'm a coastal scientist. I want to know where the waves are breaking. Um, but there, obviously, you know, water is a super class here of of of. But I've you know I've got the subclass white water in there as well. Um, and you'll see that I'm being fairly quick and rough about this. Um, I just generally tend to be quick about this because, in, as I said before, in many 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 aspects, you know. Quality is important and quantity is, is, is just as important. So I've, I'm already done with this section here. Now I'm just gonna step over, um, you know, everyone adopts their own style of doodling and, you know, I'm different every day. So I've got a different style uh, too. 
and this is you know mostly sediment here and depending on the, your intended application you know it just really does dictate on how detailed you need to be and that's also sediment over here and i'm trying to give it as you know i'm trying to go up to the boundaries as much as i can um let's have a look here terrestrial vegetation yeah let's i'm gonna for the, for the purposes of this class i'm gonna call terrestrial vegetation i'm gonna just call these big bushes up here um and maybe this little bush here and then other bare ground i'm gonna basically capture all of this partially vegetated um kind of natural terrain here um but again this is just for the for demonstration purposes here we go you know and i'm gonna make sure that i'm gonna be fairly careful about what I'm doodling in between these smaller classes here. This is really where the benefit of the stylus comes in, where you can really kind of give it the information that it might need. That's probably more than enough. And then I've got development as a class, which is going to be my roads uh, and my buildings. I'm a little cold, so I'm kind of shaking a bit, but um, hopefully this is going to work out pretty well. I'm going to just scribble on these little buildings. You might take a little, little bit more time here, but um, just for the purposes of demonstration, I think this should be sufficient. Here's an interesting situation where, you know, I don't really know what to call it. This is, this is a bunch of cars that are on the beach. So, you know, I'm going to use the unusual class here because this isn't necessarily something that I care about in my model, but I don't, I don't want to actually include it as, as something else that I might care about. Dan, can I cut in here and ask oh, a few questions from the oh. chat? One is, can you demonstrate how to uh, delete a doodle, make a mistake, and then delete it? Yeah, why don't I do that? So here I've I've um, I've slipped. Oh, whoops! And now I'm going to select that doodle. It's hard with a stylus. And then here it says erase active shape. So there you go. That's how you do that. And the other question is about doodling outside the box. Oh yeah, do doodling outside the box is strongly encouraged. You know, it, it's all part of the way that this is rapidly done. So yeah, that's that's totally fine. The, the, the algorithm won't care about that. And I just want to mention here two things. Like if you're watching this, I, I imagine you're like, well, oh, oh, you missed a spot or you mislabeled a certain area. And I think that that's a very normal thing. And that's why we talk about this iterator agreement and also to adjudicate different uh, doodles to see if you're correctly labeling a place that bare uh, that's bare ground and other people are as well. And also we've talked about um, actually getting on the phone or getting on a call and doodling all at the same time. So you, you, you have a very clear understanding of what these classes mean in the real world in the actual imagery that you're looking at, because it turns out that most people do not have the same understanding even of these curt class lists even if you are a coastal scientist you might have a completely different feeling absolutely so you'll see that that took a little bit of time because i had lots of doodles in lots of different classes across the entire scene you'll definitely notice that the more classes that you have the longer it will take um I'm not this computer I'm running with here doesn't have a, a big amount of RAM or anything like that, and it's not particularly fast. So that's a reasonable example, I think, of how long it might take to expect to see that. Um, okay. I guess that's the. Is does anyone else want to see anything else? Like, does anyone else have got any questions about other aspects of this before we start doodling ourselves. I, I'm happy to do another one and we can use this one as. Dan, can you just show the directory structure to show exactly oh, where yeah. the classes.txt file sits in that top level of the directory? Absolutely. Um, where's my mouse? Um, desktop, desktop one. <laughs> So bear with me here, I've got many screens. Okay, so this is what you're looking at. Um, you know, the, so the, basically the, the things that you need to know are that your images go in the assets folder. So these are the images that I've put together for the purposes of this demonstration. Um, we just use JPEGs, only JPEGs are supported. 
but it's usually quite easy to convert your images to JPEGs. We, we, as I think uh, Evan's already mentioned that we're planning on doing a sprint in, in the spring. And one of the things that I want to do is, is have support for every type of a common image. So PNGs and TIFFs and things like that. Um, this is your labeled folder. So these are the ones that have already been done. It also keeps track of the images that you've done in this text file here, which is basically that's just a list of those images that you've done. And this will get over, uh, like th this will be overwritten every time you launch a new session. Your results folder, your results go in here. Um, it's just dated time, time date stamped, and it's the start of the session. I actually started this session three days ago, and I haven't, uh, I haven't turned off my computer since then. Um, there's a couple of different outputs that you see. Um, these really, these PNGs, these are really just for your reference. Um, these, these aren't necessarily the things that you use. Um, what you end up using uh, are these NPZ files. So NPZ is um, it's just a zip archive. It's just a, a compressed zip archive um, that you can open using any, any utility that you have on your operating system that you would ordinarily use to open zips, zipped folders. Um, so that could be like 7-zip, or in, I've got Ubuntu here, so I can just open it up. Inside here, you've got a list of arrays. Um, this is your image. This is the, the final label that it made in, in grayscale. So this is just your, these are just integers um, where, where zero is the first class, and then your last class is whatever. Um, whatever number associated with your last class. The settings that you used, oh, I didn't really go into the settings. Maybe I could do that. But the settings that you, maybe maybe whilst we're doodling together, we can go through the settings together. I'm sure you've got questions about that. Um, so the difference between image and original image is just that the um, doodler will take uh, the image that you provide it and create what's called a standardized image so it's it subtracts the mean divides out by the standard deviation and that just help that's just a generic thing that is useful for application of machine learning models on any type of data you want something that's kind of distributed um that's standardized these are the doodles that you made so one of the really cool things about doodle and really something that we should really hammer home is that it's fully reproducible right you can go all the way back to the original scribbles that you made and you can reconstruct them again in a different algorithm. There would be nothing stopping you from taking this file. And if you weren't happy with the outputs that, that Doodler encodes or the, or the machine learning that Doodler encodes, you could, you could run these doodles through a different algorithm of your own invention. Um, and that may, and you know, it also means that we can kind of go all the way back and we can see, we can spot errors and things like that just by looking at the original doodles. It also provides an interesting opportunity for nerds like uh, Evan and I who are interested in just this whole human computer interaction of just like why do people make the decisions that they make and, and that's especially relevant where you have complex landforms where you might see model error that you're trying to trace down and, and those types of things so we're trying to be um, we're trying to make this in such a way that you know we can go all the way back to the root cause of, of any problems that we might identify. Uh, color doodles, that's just the color scale that, that we've got built in. That's just really for the purposes of visualization. And then uh, the classes that you made, you know, you don't want to necessarily keep track of all of these classes.txt files that you make. You might have different projects that you work on and it's difficult to keep track of. So everything's basically included in here. If you go through several iterations of, I wonder if I have an example here. Yeah, there's one. So if you go through several iterations, of um, doodling like let's this in this image I wasn't happy with the first time around so I'd hit compute segmentation I looked at it I wasn't happy I did some more doodling and I hit it again and then I was happy and so it keeps track of the original things that you did there's a little bit of duplication here but it keeps track of the settings that made that the first model and it keeps track of the settings that made the second one so there's plenty of opportunity here to look at um, what settings might be optimal over a whole class set, oh, sorry, over a whole image set. And there's also plenty of opportunity to actually revert that if you wanted to, you could revert back to the original label if you wanted to. So, and they're just, they're just uh, prepended with a zero. And um, 
if you have multiple rounds of this, then you'll see zero, zero, or zero, zero, zero. And they're basically, every time you add a new one, it just depends on you zero. Um, so that's the MPZ file. If you don't work in, if you're not a, a heavy user of Python and you're super comfortable with like make, like using and interacting with these this file format, um, I can tell you that there are um, NPY and MPZ readers for MATLAB and for C++ and C Sharp or whatever you use, um, or Fortran even, I think there's, there's an NPY reader. So the, this is a fairly portable um, format. And in the easiest possible situation, we provide the in the utilities folder uh, a script to sort of reconstitute the images and get overlays and get labels, which we'll discuss after we do these doodling. Yeah, there's a number of utilities here that I'm excited to show you. That like Doodler is is these is kind of this is kind of the way that you interface your Doodle out, outputs with the rest of whatever you want to do, be it Jim or be it something else that you may want to do. So we'll spend a little bit of time later on on that. Um, as I said before, this is your classes.txt file. This is just a simple text file. Um, nothing more to say there. You just list them in the order that you want them appear. I tend to make I tend to put the uh, the most common things at the top and the least common things at the bottom. And I think that's good good practice. Uh, I think that's pretty much it. So at the moment we've got this environment, but really it's just so this is your conda environment. But you'll see if you read the readme, you'll see that we actually now um, this is just a uh, this is a fallback um, for situations where this, the recipe that we pr provided on the readme, if that doesn't work, then you can fall back to this. We had a couple of issues with um, dependencies that were going out of date, so we, we had to provide that fallback just in case anyone was running on an older version of Python, uh, specifically Python 3.6. Python 3.6 is though it's pretty old now, and so we don't recommend using it. The current um, condo environment is uh, Python 3.8. If you're interested in the code, then it, um, oops, then, you know, most of the code is, well, it's all really in this app.py. And then there's this other utility, there's this other pip installable set of, um, of functions that we can talk about later on as well. Well, it's almost the hour. So I think we should get on with doodling, eh, Evan? Um, yeah, that sounds great. I'm sure you're all burning with, uh, well, not all of you, but I'm sure there's many questions that you have. And let's just, uh, in, let's, I'm going to hand over to Evan now so he can introduce the collaborative doodling part. And then as we kind of get to grips with the, with the doodler tool together, um, I'm, Evan and I are happy to take your questions that you might have. Yeah, so I think that there were a lot of great questions that I saw that I didn't get to or didn't get to ask. I just, I think that this would be a great time to do that uh, just live or Dan, you and I can scroll through the chat or if people just wanna ask the questions, I think they'd be really valuable for people to hear what they are because there's some great ones. But this is what we sort of intend for everybody to do. So get Doodler working on your machine. If Doodler's working on your machine, put the images that were either your own images or ones we have from the Google Drive in the assets folder. Modify the classes.txt file to what you want if you have your own images, or I think there's a classes.txt in every one of the Google Drive folders. Fire up Doodler and doodle some images and you'll see how it goes. There's some great questions in the chat and if you have any others, we'd be happy to uh, answer them. And I think we can do this for 15 or 20 minutes and, and it'll work out great. And I think that we're very interested if you doodle the images that are in the Google Drive, if you can put everything from your results folder back into the Google Drive. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to make it, we'll contact everybody about making a full Zenodo data release with all the contributors as co-authors. So that's the benefit of doing those. You can do them now or you can finish them up uh, later on, but that's where I'll leave it. And I'll stop sharing my screen. Yeah, we thought it'd be fun to, uh, you know, actually get a, an outcome out of this that was just beyond understanding. And if you, you can always opt out of the Zenodo release if, if you don't want to be part of it. But um, I saw, a, I guess, while we're, I'm guessing at this point, everyone's just kind of getting to they're launching the program. And so maybe I'll take a bit of a couple of minutes to answer some of the questions that I've already seen. Does that sound good, Evan? 
yeah, I think that that's great. I think that's what we should do for sure. Okay, so the first question I want to address is from Aleha. She says, uh, do you have tools to automatically split images into smaller sub images? Um, there's one tool in the, in the, just one basic tool in the utility script that allow you to resize an image. So, you know, that's something that you could probably do with any image manipulation tool that you might have, like GIMP or Photoshop or whatever. And that's just a programmatic way that you might be able to, that you could do it. It's very simple. Um, I personally have lots of different codes that I'm willing to contribute to the zoo repository, I think, uh, or to maybe as a, an, an extra utility to the gym repository. Those specifically would work with um, uh, geospatial images. I tend to work with things like geotiffs. So I tend to use this thing called GDAL, which you may have heard of, uh, Geospatial Data Abstraction Library. Um, that has a tool that's called GDAL Retile. And I use that ex uh, basically exclusively to, to kind of chop my large images up into smaller ones. Um, and then as Evan, said you know he uses image magic image magic is a, another it's a cross-platform tool um it, you can do it's a swiss army knife of image manipulation and you can do all sorts of stuff including chopping up images into into smaller bits and with overlap and things like that um julie's question i think we covered with the the erasing it's a little clunky to do the erasing but it, it generally works fairly well Josh asked about scoring the softmax. I don't think we store the softmax in you know, the PZ. You know, I actually, I had that thought during yeah. the middle of the night last night, <laughs> um, which is interesting. Yes, that's, uh, that, that's a great idea, Josh. Um, we don't store the softmax, and so we should. That's a great idea. So if anyone doesn't know what the softmax is, that's just the raw outputs from the, from the machine learning model. So that's the, those are the, the probabilities. Uh, they're not true probabilities. Um, their conditional probabilities, but um, yes, we should do that. Good call. Herben says, is the classification pixel-based or is it object-oriented? It's definitely pixel-based. So if you wanted to turn this into an object-oriented um, uh, classification, then you would undergo at least one further step. Uh, typically, you would just kind of take the pixels and then convert them into vectors, right, like objects which are essentially polygons of the continuous regions that you've made. Um, that can be done in MATLAB. It can be done in Python. There's various tools that allow you to do that. If you're a Python user, I would recommend using uh, scikit-image. It has a, a function called region props. Actually, it's the same function in MATLAB, I believe, region props. So that would be what I'd recommend, unless anyone else knows of something better. The other, the other step that usually goes in that is a little bit of smoothing, like objects are typically smooth um, and not necessarily at the pixel level. So one thing that you may want to do as an intermediate step would be to actually pass a filter, a spatial filter, high, uh, sorry, a low pass filter over the image. So you get, uh, re you remove some of the, some of the kind of salt and pepper noise and things like that. Uh, unclassified areas, we tend to provide a, a separate class. Um, so you'll see um, in the, in, there's a couple of different ones that I had um, in my demo. I don't know if you saw, one was no data, and then the other one was unknown. And they're useful kind of probability sinks if you don't know what you're looking at. So the other thing I should mention is that if your images are, if they contain black pixels, i.e. Zero, 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 then that will get propagated into the label. So if there's completely black pixels, then you obviously have no idea what that is. So um, we decided that the best thing to do there, instead of interpolate over that space, which could be large or it could be small, um, we decided to just propagate those zeros through to the end result. So that's just a null class. Uh, how am I doing, Evan? I think you're doing great. <laughs> okay. Uh, so that's an interesting question from Nolan. So, like, you know, yeah, that's the one I was pondering. Close to you, I interpret that as like how close do you need to be to a transition? Um, but it's also how 
accurate do you need to be when you're labeling? Yeah, That's exactly. That's the, I think that the, there's actually two questions right there embedded in one. In terms of the accuracy, I mean, there's a setting still on the side that says the percent of the, how much the algorithm trusts the doodles, which I think is pegged at 90%. Yeah. Yeah, that's one thing you mod modify. Um, it's just, it really does depend on the application. So like yeah. long skinny things like roads are just generally difficult for Doodler. However, if you're careful enough, then I've seen many many examples where it's, it's pretty good. Um, so it's just about kind of developing, it's part of the art of Doodler, I would say. Um, it's kind of developing an intuition for how, how, many, how much, how many, and how accurate your doodles need to be. Um, if we get around to it, we can do a blog post on it. I find that also to be application specific, like images, oblique aerial images, the intuitions that I develop on those don't often transfer to like Landsat scenes or something like that. All right. So unfortunately, there's a little bit of trial and error to understand how the um, coarseness of the pixels is going to interplay with the output of that. Uh, two-step machine learning process. Let us know, Nolan, if that, if that doesn't answer your question. Um, Eddie Yema, you're referring to the number of pixel points to be picked. So, so I think what you're referring to there is how much do you need to doodle on the scene? Is that right? Um, if so, then you'd be surprised sometimes. It depends on how how complex it is. Like if you only have two glasses, for example, like that first one, that, I, that little movie that I showed that was just the beach and the, and the water, you can generally get away with doing much less. But if you have kind of a, a much more complex scene where there's lots of stuff going on, like the example that I did, then generally you need to do a, a few more. But again, it's part of the art of this and you do need to develop a little bit of an intuition for it. It's, it's the non-deterministic part of Doodler. You know, when we say it's fully reproducible, we just mean it. it's like it's deterministic in the sense that we can take the doodles and we can recreate the scene that you can see from the doodles that you've made because it's the same algorithm. However, if you were to slightly change the doodles, then you'll see that you get slightly different results. And so it's really it's it's part of the process. Hopefully that answers your question. I'm always surprised at how little I need to doodle and how if I focus on the edges between classes, so two lines drawn next to each other, different classes, uh, really does a superb job at reducing the number of doodles I need um, and time I need to spend. So I'll just say that. And also, we've noticed in the past that if you iteratively add classes, if you're just like, if you draw water, and draw if it's four classes and you draw two of the classes in, you should not hit compute segmentation just to see how you're doing. You should do all of the classes that you see in an image and then compute the segmentation. So instead of just adding classes one by one and seeing how you're doing, you should do all of them at once. That's just another common issue. Yeah. You know, I'd say that a lot of these answers that we're given as well, they're really just kind of dependent on our personal experience of it. Um, we've kind of gone back and forth over some of the decisions that we kind of encapsulate in the software just because they work, as I said before, they kind of work generally across the board. But if you find that, um, you know, you could make tweaks to your specific needs, then we encourage you to do so. I mean, that's the, basically that's the whole point of providing this open source tool. And we're happy to provide guidance over it to um, if you make an issue or a discussion on GitHub. Um, I saw, did, I think Sharon answered C. Jong Cho's question. Um, so maybe I'll skip that one. Julie, when you doodle in the white space around the image, uh, did I answer that question already? Yeah. Lindsay, I just wanted to mention that I tend to user ID, it's a bit initials or something longer. It doesn't matter for what you put in. Just ask people, especially if you're organizing a large team, ask them to be consistent so you that you can easily use like a command line to, tool to relabel anything or anonymize everything. 
anonymize all the labelers. I'll say that when Dan and I have done doodle releases, releases of images and labels in the past, we tend to include everybody who wants to be an author whose, la whose labeled images are allowed to be an author if they want. So these data, that's the best practice for if you get people to do your work to include them as authors on these data releases in Zenodo. But we also try have both tried to anonymize the, the labels so that uh, everybody, you can't just, if there's an error that somebody made, it, it can't be blamed as me uh, going forward into the future. So it's helpful to have those people be very consistent with their IDs so that you can replace them with labeler one, labeler two in the future. Yeah, and I would add that if you're going to go, if you're going to embark upon a multi-labeler exercise like this, then you should, um, it'd, be, it'd be informative to look at the Coach Jane paper that's up on archives. Uh, sorry, Earth Archive, um, because we kind of talk about like, you know, how we decided upon how many people to use, like what imagery to use and how many people and how to how to do it. Um, the Doodler paper itself has a data release that's on Zenodo that is anonymized, like the same way as Co-Strain. You can download either of those two. Evan's got a couple of different Zenodo releases for, that are similar. You know, he published one this week, actually, and that's over a thousand, over 1200 images of you know, and it's being contributed to by like, I don't know, what, 10 or more people. Yeah, 12. So, so we have, you know, so we have some uh, experience with that. So just get in contact with us if you want some advice. And Julie, yes, please just upload everything from your results file back to the Google Drive folder. Um, I think I'm going to address Alea's question about uh, so yes, the general the general pipeline is to subset the images into smaller, doodle them, and then you would train a model on that scale of imagery. Um, we're working on workflows um, for a downstream application called Safety Map. This is something that Sharon Fitzpatrick and Venus is uh, uh, Venus Koo is helping us with. Um, it's not quite ready yet, but that, that's going to provide um, a. a a set of codes for kind of stitching your labels back together. If so, if you if you're in a situation like this where you have a larger satellite image, then your gym model is going to predict at smaller scales, and then you need a subsequent script to basically then stitch them together. Those workflows I've worked out, and I just need to find some time to get them up onto onto Seg2 Map. So watch this space and uh, give me a nudge if you don't think I'm being quick enough. The um, the other question though is that. That's an interesting one. It's like, yeah, um, what we can only visualize in three bands, as you know, and we tend to use RGB images, um, but that's it's not limited to that. You could use false color images if you find it more informative. We've gone through some exercises with that. Like, obviously, if you're going to use like you know NDWI or NDVI or something like that, then that, then it's going to bring out the vegetation, sorry, the water and vegetation respectively. So yeah, I encourage doing that. Um, the doodles that you make and the label that gets generated from that would obviously apply to all of the subsequent coincidence, all of the coincident bands that you have. So you could you could train your model, your gym model, you could train it on the image, on the three bands that you happen to use for the purposes of doodling. Or if you have more bands, then you could use all of the bands, or you could select the bands that you like. You'll see in the in the paper that describes the gym toolbox that Evan and I wrote earlier this year um, that we'll get to next week and we'll get we'll get to this next week is is you can use any number of bands we used five bands um, for the purposes of satellite image segmentation because we wanted to include the near infrared and the shortwave infrared but the doodles that you make could be repurposed like you could take the doodles and you could run them through the the machine learning to get and apply them to a different band combination if you wanted to but that you're always limited to three bands in that in that scope. Um, how many more minutes should we? I mean, it's, it's quarter after. We probably will need about fifteen minutes for the utilities. But yeah, um, I think that that's fine to just whenever you're ready. I think there are a few more questions. I'm answering some direct messages, but I think a few more came in. Cool. Uh, you don't have to read it, restart Doodle for each new image recommend restarting it just when you're done i mean like kind of pick off a manageable amount of images to doodle and that's usually you know how well for much time you have and uh you can each session will just pick up from the last one you can one of the things that you'll probably notice about if you've stopped doodle is that you have to use control c 
because I'm not a software developer, I'm a geoscientist, and I couldn't, I couldn't figure out how to put an exit button in there. Um, if you can figure it out, then uh, please contribute that back. But um, you just use Control C uh, to, to stop the program, and then you can just relaunch it again, and you're basically where you where you ended up, as long as you haven't moved the images out of the, of the assets in the label folders. Um, yeah, the sticking around for yeah, but so that's more so that's a question that I'm, I'm trying to catch up here, but that's a question that Sharon already answered about this on occasion you'll see that the doodles stick around. That's not something that we've been able to figure out. It's not necessarily something in the codes that we wrote. It's more in the way that the codes are kind of translated into what the browser understands. So it's kind of more maybe it's more of a jar, JavaScript or a caching problem. But we've noticed that um, that's essentially and primarily why we are recommending Firefox is because it tends to not be so much of a problem if, if you're using Firefox. Um, but uh, yeah, it's something that we need to we need to try to get a handle on. And again, please contribute answers if you have them. Uh, Can Jim geocode your images? Uh, no, but the this seg2 map thing that I previously talked about um, will be able to stitch them back together. So you'll if you have geospatial inputs, so you have you can have geospatial outputs. We have done um, doodler with time lapse photos. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's worked quite well. Yeah. Um, so in that sense, like you can actually. If, if you get to grips with the, the, what the, the kind of functions that Doodle is using under the hood, you can actually take your doodles and apply them to a time series of images. Like you can doodle one scene and then apply them to a whole bunch of subsequent scenes, as long as you think that your doodles would remain relevant to them, if that makes sense. That's something that we've done. And it's, uh, we actually used to have a utility to do that. Uh, but I got rid of it because I didn't think it was generally useful, but maybe I'll put it back in. Um, Herben, you permission error. I think it's solved. Was that solved? Okay, great. Oh yeah, browser refresh. That that basically solves anything with Doodle. <laughs> Just browser refresh. That's the same thing. If, you're, if your doodles are sticking around, then you, have, you, you kind of, if you're stuck there, then you have to do a browser refresh. One of the annoying things about Doodler is that um, because of this timer that goes on in the background, I think because of the timer that goes on in the background, it can sometimes take a minute for it to refresh that list. And you can select an image, and then you notice that you go back to the other tab quickly, and you notice that either the doodles have persisted or that the image hasn't changed. You just have to, um, I just tend to select it twice. Um, but Evan, Evan says that he, he selects it and then waits a couple of seconds. So it's just one of the quirks of, of using research software and not canned software, I think. Um, but yeah, if, if all else fails, do a browser refresh. And the only downside with that really is that uh, you have to put your initials back in into your ID if, if that's if, or, or your ID if that's what you're doing. Is there examples of doodles that can help? Oh, yeah, that's a good call. Um, I did throw some examples up on the Google Drive, Evan, but. Um, oh, I don't think those are, I didn't think, I think that was an internal folder that I kept for you and I. Yeah. Um, what should we do? Mm. I can move them over. I'll move them over right now. Yeah, we've got some examples, Lindsay, um, that we can show you and you can have a look at them. I think the other thing I wanna mention is that you can ping us with questions uh, on GitHub would be the best place to do that. Even after, you know, well after the class, like Dan and I receive a lot of emails about these things that were always, these tools that we're very happy to answer. You know, if it's a specific software issue, that can go in the issues tab. If it's a, just a discussion that you want to um, talk about something, that can go in discussions. 
you can just make a new one and feel free to um, tag us. And we're very happy to talk about it. Obviously, it's a cool tool that we're very excited if people are using, so it gets us jazzed. Yeah. Um, I also want to make a little plug for this other thing that we're making. It's called Hollow Doodler. And it's basically, um, we when we decided to do Doodler, we, you know, I was pretty green when it came to writing web applications like this. So I decided to use um, Plotly and Dash because it was something that had a short, small learning curve for me. Um, but, you know, we've identified these kind of these little issues with it, which kind of might just be the it kind of it's easier to use a different um, application API to to actually create the, the GUI. So we had Anaconda have a look at this and they came up with a little demo of, of, a, of an alternative tool that uses their hollow views platform. And you can just Google that hollow views. Um, it's a it's it's just a something that's like Plotly, but it's slightly different. And it allows you, it's it's mostly used for making like interactive dashboards and data viewers and things like that. Um, but we have this other thing that's called Hollow Doodler and it's it's working, but it's kind of still under a little bit of development. And a lot of these issues that we're looking at here, like the doodles persisting, for example, they they seem to be so much of a problem in Hollow Doodler. So um, watch this space, and um, you, know, you can always watch the repository on on GitHub if you want to get updates um, or submit. You know, use it and contribute to it. You know, that's another. So we're kind of with pursuing that route as well. We're seeing whether we can make a slightly better version of Doodler using this different platform. Um, and you'll also notice if you've, if you've been to the, the Doodleverse GitHub page, you'll notice that there's a whole bunch of different repositories on there that are outside of the ones that we've spoken about. You know, you, you're familiar now with Dash Doodler and we've introduced Jim and Zoo, but you'll see that Hollow Doodle is on there as well. Um, and then there's this, other, this seg to map, which I've talked about, which right now doesn't have any code in it, but we're getting there. But then you'll also see that there's this thing called Doodler Engine. And so I just wanted to spend maybe a second talking about that while we're maybe wrapping up the doodling. So Doodler Engine is basically, they're the codes that actually do the machine learning part of this. So the way that it's we've set it up, because we, we've got these two downstream applications, Dash Doodler and Hollow Doodler, the way that we set it up is that we've had we have this pip installable um, set of Python codes that really is just a set of functions that both tools use, and they're just for for turning your doodles into labels. Um, that is where you would need to go if you wanted to modify the way that Doodler behaves, like the actual machine learning part, or if you wanted to actually start helping us develop these tools. If you're interested in that, then then you should become familiar with that as well, and um, that these are the codes that Hollow Doodler uses too. So you say, you you save your image just it, it gets saved automatically. So you should notice that when you hit the compute show segmentation and it and it completes the segmentation, if you uncheck that box, you should see that um, it just appears in your folder. And you know that it's there because a new NPZ file has, has appeared and a new PNG file has appeared. So Irina says, um, you mentioned that the tools help you pre-process with TensorFlow. Yes, we're gonna talk a lot more about that next week. That's a that's basically the first step in Jim is that taking images of, uh, sorry, folders of images and labels and then converting them into a format um, that TensorFlow understands. We're gonna talk quite a lot about that next week. So Irene, I'd say if you're signed up for next week, then um, maybe it's best that we talk about that then if that's okay. If you're not signed up, um, then, uh, Oh, here you are. Yeah, I'll, I'll miss it next week, but I'll catch the recording. OK, um, great. I have like something going on that, um, um, so I, I can't make it this time that, that week. But yeah, yeah, I was, I was curious what your experiences were with that. So like maybe I'll leave that question for them. <laughs> well, I can I can answer it real briefly. I mean, it, like basically, it's not too much of a challenge to get the uh, images and labels into tensors. And that's what TensorFlow needs. 
However, mm -hmm. there's a couple of different formats that TensorFlow understands. One is, you know, the, the, the kind of canonical one is called uh, TF records. And we initially adopted TF records, but they're quite difficult to, you have to write, you, they're quite difficult to access if you're trying to debug stuff or if you're trying to use them in multiple contexts or if you're trying to, you know, transfer them over to another machine learning library like scikit-learn or PyTorch or whatever. So there's a lot of downsides to using TensorFlow records, in my opinion. So we adopted this, we adopted basically the same format uh, for Jim as we um, have adopted for Doodle, which is this MPZ format. And it works really well. I mean, you can, it, it works well in that you can, um, you can set up a TensorFlow pipeline that efficiently throughputs your data onto a GPU or multiple GPUs for the purposes of model training. But it's also this really accessible format that you can just write a really simple Python script to just like access that data. So mm -hmm. that's basically how we do it. Um, All I want to say is that that's set up in a way that if you're monitoring with like top uh, your CPU utilization and then NVIDIA SMI to look at your GPU utilization, the pipeline is set up so that your GPU utilization should be super duper high. Like it very quickly is giving information to Tensor to the GPU for TensorFlow to operate, which is was a, a challenging to get working, but is really great. Your GPU stays very hot. For the yeah, I'm, I'm just learning about it now. And I was like, I know like you guys were like already like 15,000 steps ahead. So I'm, I, I was gauging like how your experience was with like passing it from this stage into that. And then I don't know, like, I think there seems like in the CSDMS community, there could be like a huge like step forward if we also start doing this with like model imagery. Um, and then I don't know, like, um, some of the stuff that I'm seeing here, um, like does that, but th they were using TensorFlow for that too. So it's a, it's more like a future forward looking, um, idea than that. It's like something that I concretely do now. Yeah. It would be been... amazing to see more models access the GPU. That would be awesome. Great. Yeah, like check out this this uh, new glacier model. It's called IGM, and it's does that. It's called I instructed glacier model. And I know there's a, a inspiration ocean climate model that uses it just uh, came out, right? Yeah, yeah, that uses not NumPy but Jax NumPy, which yeah. can um, operate super fast on GPU. So it, which just requires an extra letter J instead of NP dot whatever it's J. -NP. Right. Right. And that's like how the TensorFlow also seems to, it's like there's a lot of TFs in front yeah. of everything. And like, there you go. It's quite amazing. Anyway, I'll, I'll make sure that I'll catch the recording, but uh, I know that I can't make it next week, but I super appreciate that you guys have like laid this out for us today. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, it's a it's a new dawn when it comes to using um, machine learning in in numerical modeling, and I'm super excited about what I'm seeing. Um, but yeah, we'll talk much more about that next week, and you can catch the recording. Um, so we are at ten. Yeah, we should use now. utils. Yeah, we should probably switch to utils now. Thanks, Sharon, for doing such a great job at answering questions too on the chat. Um, should we switch then? Yes. How's everyone feeling about their doodles? Just real briefly. You can you can tell us in the video or you can tell us in the chat. It's fun, awesome. <laughs> um, as we as as we've said a couple of times, you know, for those who are having a little technical issues, then hopefully we, you know you can get through them and and catch up later on. And um, but for now, we're going to switch to oh heaven. Permission denied. Maybe you're on a. Are you on a? Um, did you install your Python with administrative privileges or something like that? Maybe that's something to look into. Um, but for now, I think we're going to switch to the util so we can actually finish on time. Um, I think I have it called up if you want me to just at least run gen images. Sure. Yeah, go, go for it. Actually, no, no, don't, because I want to, I, there was a couple of things I wanted to do. I wanted to run gen images and then I wanted to show one other tool. Yeah, so go for if, it. If then. you don't mind, actually, no, actually, no, not at all. I'll take that on. Um, 
I just have to figure out what desktop. It's like the hardest thing to do. Okay, so as we said um, earlier on, the, the utils, we have a whole bunch of different utilities here. We're not going to be able to go through all of them, but um, I, we won't go through the ones that are most common, and especially the ones that really going to interface this class with the next class for those for those of you who are going to join that next class. Um, and that one, so here's my Doodle window, and I've just got another window open here. So once you have um, a set of results like I have here, then there's a couple of different utilities that you might find useful. Um, the first one is uh, gen, gen images and labels. And all that's going to do is it's going to take your MPZ files um, that you just made. So you just point it, it's going to bring up this dialogue and you can point it to this folder, this top level folder. You wouldn't necessarily have this one here. That was just me doing some prep. Um, so you hit OK there. And then what it's doing right now is it's just stepping through each of what, each one of my NPC files and it's just generating a set of images, a set of labels and a set of overlays. And that's really, that's the first port call really is to, it's kind of to see how good your, uh, your doodles were in some sense. And then it's also your second port call if you're going to then use that for any subsequent process. So, you know, it's just a, it's an easy way to get the information out of this in formats that you might understand. So this, these are actually just the images that I already made, but the, so that I already labeled, but um, the only difference is now that I've appended my ID to them, right? So this is useful for that multi-labeler context if we're trying to keep track of multiple people doing the same imagery. And then these are the labels and don't be scared that they, they appear black. It's because I only have um, 11 classes and so, my, my numbers are distributed between zero and 10, right? So this is a full range 8-bit image. So it accepts zero to 255. And it's not a photograph that has uh, got a high dynamic range. It's, it's just a low dynamic range. So, so the information's in there. And the way that you know it's in there is because you can see these, um, these overlay images, right? So that was that one that was all water. Here's that one that I did in the, in the demo. And then here's a couple that I did earlier. And you can see, you know, that's that's kind of me kind of rush, rushing through uh, a few of these deals. But you can see that it, it's worked. And those are still usable, even with, if you notice that sometimes the um, developed class blurs between houses, like that's totally okay. Yeah. It, it downstream um, tasks will perform super well, even with imagery like this. Yeah, this is kind of pointing to what I was saying earlier on about like, you know, I, I could have done a slightly better job here, but you know, in, you know, I just did this as a one shot. Yeah. But, nah, I could have done it and you know it. But, but um, even if I hadn't, I don't care because I know that the model that I'm going to train, because I can I can make these, I can make these labels 10 times quicker than I can any other software. So I can make 10 times as many labels for the process of um, training my deep learning model. And we'll see next week, we'll actually We'll actually do a model next week and you will see this live that we have noisy data this is the data that we're planning on actually taking all of the images that you do today if we can and making a model out of them and so we're going to use everyone's different opinions about what things look like and i think i'm fairly confident that we'll get a really good model in the end of it so we'll see we'll see we'll put our money where our mouth is next week uh, and then these are the doodles so you know depending on the pen width that you adopted and the image size these can be a little hard to see sometimes we're using small images and and um just what the default pen size is which is three and you can just kind of verify that you do things correctly in that way okay so that was the first utility and the second utility that i wanted to show um is this thing called label generation so on occasion you might see like errors um in the data. So this is a way to troubleshoot, but it's also a way to pull out just the, the as, as you remember, there's a two-step process in Doodler. There's the NLP and then there's the CRF. And they produce slightly different outputs sometimes. And you may decide that your free, you know, what gets stored is the CRF version, but you may decide that your NLP version is actually better. And this is a way for you to get at that. Um, but it's also a way for you to do any troubleshooting if you need to. And so what this basically does is that it's going to step through each of these uh, NPZ files and it's going to generate, it's going to basically step through all of the things that happened when, the, when you saw the blue box on your screen, right? It's going to just take the doodles again. It's going to run them through the algorithms again, and it's going to generate all of those outputs. So the first thing it does is just that's the, 
that's the difference between a normal image and a standard image. You won't notice, sometimes you won't notice the difference. Um, well, it's not in order here. Uh, these are the doodles. So it's once again, that's another way for you to verify the, the ways that you doodled. But then more importantly, then you can kind of, these are the features that it generated. So you'll see that uh, one of the classifier settings is the number of scales. That's something that we brushed over. But if you know, so the number of scales is basically just uh, the number of scales over which it extracts features. By default, it's only two because generally you only need two scales, like a really fine scale and a really large scale. And it, um, but you can add more intermediate scales if you think that that's going to help your classification. It often does help with the classification, but be be warned that it does slow things down as well. Um, and this is kind of just a way for you to then just look at the, what features is actually using. So these are the features that gets passed to the to the MLP. Um, and you can see, so that's if you refer to the paper, you'll have more complete understanding of this. But this is the spatial scale. It's actually using a relative coordinate system because we're in a we're usually as geoscientists we're usually in a situation where Tobin's law applies and you know the, the the things that are closer are more similar to one another um and so it uses the relative location uh it uses the image intensity or Gaussian blur of that intensity it uses um edges and and other things that are extracted from the image that we don't need to go into but that's what it does and that's what you can see uh it's generating a whole bunch of outputs here and then it just once it's done, it pushes them into this folder, which is basically just going to show you them. So if I just click on, you know, one of one of these MLP and CRS, you'll notice that these are almost identical. There's only a couple of pixels that are actually different there, uh, but it will create the the MLP and the and the and the CRF versions of your labels, so you can kind of use them going forward. And then the last utility I wanted to show was actually this thing, which is, uh, I think it's pretty cool, but I don't know, it, I don't know how generally useful it is. It doesn't necessarily tie in with the, the subsequent work, but I wanted to do it anyway, because um, there's a different way that you could uh, use these outputs. These, as we said before, we kind of, because we're classifying at the smallest possible scale, we have an opportunity to kind of chop up the images into uh, small tiles that show you what, uh, sorry, that are examples of each of the classes that you've identified. So this make classified tiles from images and labels tool is a way to generate small tiles of a certain size. So governed by the T parameter here. So I'm going to make these 96 by 96 pixel tiles that include a certain class where the proportion of that class is, is more than 90% of, of the image. Um, so what this is going to do, I'm going to provide it um, the, I'm going to go into here and provide it the uh, label files that I just generated, which is uh, using the gen, um, gen images script. Oh, I've got to select them. And then I'm going to provide it the images as well. And what it's going to do is it's going to step through each of those. Um, and then I'll provide it the classes.txt. What it's going to do is it's just going to go through each of these and it's going to um, output uh, inside my labels folder. It's going to output this folder called tile 96. So these are, these are just example tiles of these things that I generated. And then you could use them subsequently, um, you know, in a, in a subsequent application. So this is this is my terrestrial vegetation, for example. And so this is this is then interface. This is for interfacing with a completely di different type of classification problem, where you're trying to classify a whole image. And so the, it's the situation where you want to classify not at every pixel level, but at kind of a tiled level. Um, the other utilities that we have, we're not going to have time to go into. There's the battery sizing one. Um, you'll see if you if you look at the Coast Train paper, for example, the, we have the ability to to remap classes. So this is a situation where let's say you have like a dozen classes, but you want to kind of make super classes out of them, like i.e. you want to take all your subclasses and kind of condense them into just a smaller set of classes. In the example that I showed, for example, I could combine water and white water together for a, for a generic water class. I could combine my, my three vegetation classes together, and that's how you do it. And there's an example of how you might do that. Um, but that's all we have time for on the utilities front because we're gonna we're gonna have to start wrapping things up. 
But if you uh, have any questions about that, we'd be happy to answer them. Go back to the agenda here. Um, so the next thing we're going to do. I think that's really it. If people want to continue doodling or use the utils or have, ask any other questions to ask us about what's going on, and then we can, that's sort of what the rest of the time is used for, just continuing to, to uh, get familiarity with some of these tools. And then I'll pull up the last slide that we wanted to at least leave with. Is that okay, Dan? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, maybe I brushed over that a little quickly. I think we had a no, little no, bit. No, it's of, great. We had a little bit of time, I guess, blocked out for everyone to use the utility, so they had questions. I mean, the, the main one that you're going to use is that is going to be that Gen Images and Labels. So that's the one I recommend playing with. Um, that just then creates the folders that you would then use. If you're interested in, like, if you can't wait to use Jim and you want and you want to use it over the next week, then feel free to like, you know, clone it and, and kind of go over it. We'll be issuing instructions like we did this week, um, but maybe we'll do it a little earlier. Uh, we'll kind of provide those instructions maybe just after this class or or at the very very latest at you know very beginning of next week. So you'll have a couple of days to kind of go through that. Um, you know, and get familiar with the docs and things. If you're going to, if you think you're going to become a serious user of these tools, then you know, it'd be a good, good idea to come prepared with questions. Um, and you'll have an opportunity to use those utils for real. Maybe you'll doodle a few more images. Maybe you'll doodle a few of your own images and figure out some of the kinks, you know, and, and you'll be able to communicate some of your experiences over back to us, like what worked, what didn't work, uh, how difficult it was to arrive at classes, you know, how difficult it was to get the problematic imagery how to get that you know to get that worked out and those kinds of things these are all things that we're that we're familiar with but but you know we we would always 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 uh, value your feedback on any of this stuff yeah I mean, this slide is just sort of the wrap up and the plan for the next class which is just everybody continuing to doodle if they try out doodler and put results on the google drive folder letting us know if you want to opt in and or opt out of the zenodo data release that we'll plan and prepare and then next week we'll go over jim hopefully using these uh enough of these images from doodler or if not we have zillions of free doodled images to make models from and we'd love for everybody to participate and help and join the effort on github yeah and we we'll kind of say again that we're gonna we're definitely planning on having a, a sprint in the spring or just in the new year maybe perhaps in march or some sometime like that where we're going to kind of devote that month to kind of probably you know working on a few of the issues that have been identified working on a few of the bugs that we already know about and that would go for doodler and jim you know because they work they work together and if you want to be involved in that, then you can just get involved by contacting us on, on GitHub. You know, we don't we don't do this full time. Obviously, we have we have uh, we have our research that we do too. Um, so you know, if you're frustrated with the pace of progress, then you can always um, hop in and help us. But I think that's it from my end of of stuff. Oh, I can open the chat again. Yeah, so some people had, like, you probably have figured this out already, but some people had images that were four classes and some people had images that were uh, others. If you want more imagery, then we've got more, more imagery if you want to doodle it. Um, the more you doodle, the better the our model next week is going to be. Um, so if you feel motivated uh, to doodle more, then uh, we, we're happy to give you more images. I can generate images all day. Some of the satellite scenes are a little boring. You know, I find them quite boring because they're very samey, like you might do the, the same thing. And so we got other sites that we could give you. And then the nape imagery that we gave you. Um, so for those who've not seen, for those who are working on satellite imagery, some of the participants had nape images, which are kind of one meter pixel size and a little bit more complicated. That's that's the one, that's an example that I did. And then the rest of the class has satellite imagery. And if you want to do the other images, or if you have your own images, then this is kind of this is the time to do that. And we'll stick around for the next fifteen minutes in case you have more questions. Um, 